So this project, which is funding the free rain barrel kits, is called Create Resilience. Um, and we are in the third year of this four year project. And it's really meant to inform and educate the local community about natural hazards and how we can create a more resilient community. We've been focusing on Easton, Bangor, and Wilson areas and targeting adults, municipal leaders, and students in these three areas. We've done a number of community meetings. This was pre-COVID. Um, and we've done a bunch of educational events and surveys. One of the surveys was asking about different hazards and where people felt that there were priorities. Um, not surprisingly, in Easton, flooding came out as the top priority. And then in Forks and Palmer, it was a little less. Um, also, winter storms and sinkholes were some of the higher ones. We also gathered a number of stories from the community and had a, an exhibit at our center almost two years now, um, two years ago. And this was to showcase how people experienced hazards throughout our community and how we can come together as a community to develop strategies and um, become more resilient. So this is an, a picture of that exhibit and people reading the stories and coming together. We did hazard tours. Um, so we took students and, and interested publics to different locations throughout the community that showed where hazards had affected the area or where there were positive um, riparian buffers, as an example, green roofs, solar panels, those types of strategies to help with community resiliency. And we did a bunch of outreach through forums and with our student amb ambassadors. We had um, 12 students in our first year and 14 students in our second year. And this current year, we're working on uh, developing these very large murals that we'll be having in each of the communities. So we partnered with community artists um, in Easton, Bangor, and Wilson to develop that vision based on all of the feedback and information that we've collected from residents throughout the community. So one thing as part of this project is to educate the community and to enable them to respond and help mitigate some of the impacts of those natural hazards. And one way is, of course, rain barrels, uh, which helps with stormwater runoff. It helps with conserving water and a number of other beneficial things. So because of that, um, I am going, we, we decided to partner with the Master Watershed Stewards with Penn State Extension and hold this workshop about rain barrels and uh, provide free kits to members of the community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who is a master watershed steward, and he's going to present. And then at the end, we'll talk more about logistics, the size of the barrels and where you can pick them up later. So hello everyone, I'm Mike Balk. I'm a master watershed steward. Uh, with Penn State Extension. I'm also a master gardener with Penn State Extension. Um, little background on Penn State Extension. It's part of Penn State, obviously. And they have information for homeowners, farmers, landowners, um, cooks. They do all kinds of uh, classes. They have a hotline where you can call in with questions about what is this plant or what's this bug in my garden all kinds of different things. We will have links um, later on to Penn State, uh, extension.psu.edu. That will be on the bottom of all our slides after this title slide. So we are here to, let's see, there we go. Um, this is about backyard storm, um, backyard solutions to stormwater management, rain barrels. That's why you're here. So if you're in the, Right place, excellent. Um, this is an example of a rain barrel, simple rain barrel. Uh, yours will look slightly different, different coloring, different texturing, but the concept's the same. We have uh, examples of various rain barrel solutions um, can get you thinking. Um, in basics for pondering where to put it in your property, the higher you have it, the more pressure you will have. 
and you'll be able to use more of the water. If this was sitting on the ground, you wouldn't be able to get a uh, watering can underneath the, ta uh, the spigot there. So the higher you go, um, the more you can get under it, under the uh, tap, and you can also get more water pressure if you hook a hose up to it. And here you also see a connection, a rather fancy connection to the downspout. So you will have to, in some way, divert from your current downspout to the rain barrel. But we will talk about that in upcoming slides. So here's a little bit more about Penn State. We are one of the top 20 research institutions in the nation. And there's some of the things that they offer, portfolio of educational programs, products, and services. We are in the uh, part of the land grant institution. So most university or states have a land grant university and they all have extensions and they're part of giving back to the community and education and research. So here's some pictures of various extension things, food service, plant growth, education, and research. Agriculture is one of the biggest ones that Penn State is known for. Economic, it's a big economic driver in Pennsylvania. And it uh, encompasses diverse research around animals, plants, and natural resources, food, fiber, and energy. Here's some of the programs that they help support. And you can look up at uh, extension.psu.edu to find more information about extension. So. In its simplest form, a rain barrel collects rainwater and you can use it in your landscaping. It's a method of saving water. You don't have to pay for the water uh, from the municipality or from the electricity in your pump if you have a well. And it keeps it, the flood water, the rainwater, all out of the system. It saves, uh, depending on the size of your rain barrel, about 50 gallons or so at a time. So why bother conserving? Hopefully we have an idea that cons conservation is good. Uh, there are a lot of reasons. Some of those are the fact that of all the water on the planet, only 0.3% is usable, the rest is not. So all of that water that we have, the only water that's usable is in river lakes and underground. So it's fresh water, is less than 1% of the usable water. Ice is more than 2%, and then 97% of all the water is salt water. So we have a lot of rain. We are lucky in Pennsylvania. We get about 30 to 40 inches, depending on where you are, uh, inches of rain a year. But that's not enough, and we have to save it for our friends and neighbors downstream. So you may have seen this type of water cycle uh, image in the past, maybe in school, maybe in other conservation areas. This is what water does. It's a, a continuously reusable resource from anywhere. Don't know if you can see, uh, oops, there's my pointer. Let's get a laser pointer so we can see where we're talking about. So the sun evaporates the water, which goes into the um, atmosphere, condenses, precipitates out. We have infiltration where it goes into the ground and recharges our uh, groundwater. Some of it runs off the land, surface runoff into lakes, streams, and rivers. And that also gets water, lakes get water from the groundwater and they uh, discharge into the groundwater. There's a water table here, and it goes back into rivers and rivers into the ocean, all one big cycle. And then there's a shallow aquifer and then the deep aquifer. The shallow aquifer is where we have access to it. We can drill wells down into it. What is a watershed? I'm a watershed steward, and we all are watershed stewards. 
and you live in a watershed no matter where you are you are in a watershed it's a point of land that wherever that water falls where would it roll to so there are in this picture here we have lots of things in the way there's lots of pieces and parts to our watershed in pennsylvania we have six main watersheds a little bit of potomac a little bit of the erie ohio is the western half of the state genesee valley is teeny little bit in the far north and susquehanna and delaware the two major ones delaware being the major one for the east part that we are currently in so every place is part of a watershed and these are examples of the six watersheds that pennsylvania participates in on a county level we have streams are the designation for the watershed and we have a lot of this is the lehigh uh, county here different watersheds all the little creeks you might not be able to read that the little lehigh creek the jordan creek copley creek etc all are different watersheds that flow into the lehigh river which of course then flows into the delaware which is the name of our watershed stormwater might have a pretty good idea of what that is stuff that runs off and doesn't infiltrate into the ground so off the house any impermeable surface streets parking lots and it picks up whatever's on top of that surface and runs it into streams and waterways in the past we've all wanted to get rid of water as fast as possible get it out of here drain everything off your lawn and property so that it you don't have to deal with it and we're now realizing that that might not be the best overall solution we have uh storm water impacts flat biggest ones pollution and, uh, is on that those impermeable surfaces gets washed off and because it goes so fast we get the flash flooding and that's one reason that Easton is worried about flooding more than the others because they have the big waterways flooding is obviously a big one especially in Easton lots of property damage pollution runoff uh, this is a discharge you see a lot of silt and soil from even in the back here off of the farmland that just looks like it was recently tilled you might say well dirt is not a pollution but it actually is it's one of the biggest um, killers of our local streams and waterways it uh, kills all the the growth and insect life and plant life that's in there it just covers it all up and doesn't allow much growth you also get stream bank erosion especially when you have flash flooding which takes more of the soil and and hurts the stream populations sediment is what i've been mentioning that's the runoff the dirt and you see here on the bottom it's just a muddy soggy mess there's no um, life no grass growing no uh, water plants no bugs are going to be living in there bugs being the generic term for um, uh, life that lives in the in the nooks and crannies of our streams and usually under rocks and things like that this suffocates them out so groundwater recharge we want the uh under underwater underground areas to be recharged with water through infiltration if you have we have two examples here one is a semi-natural non-impermeable surfaces 40 percent evapotranspiration 10 percent runoff and a lot goes 50 percent goes into the ground to recharge our our water sources if you have a lot of buildings and impermeable surfaces you get a little less evapotranspiration where it just evaporates off the surfaces and you get a lot more runoff which leaves a lot less to infiltrate into the groundwater 
So infiltration is the big key. You can find out how fast things infiltrate. Here we have a little example of a PVC pipe of a certain uh, depth. It looks maybe like five, six inches deep. Fill water. Forest, it's going to infiltrate 50, over 15 inches per hour into the ground. On a compacted dirt road, might go five inches an hour. And on a lawn, surprisingly, you only get, a, a you know, depending on, on what type of soil you have, you might only get an inch or so. And pavement, of course, no infiltration per hour. So here we have humans have changed the way land is used. And even rural areas are increasing, um, have seen an increase in polluted stormwater runoff and flooding. So it's important to remember that somebody else is always downhill of you. So water always flows downhill, and unless you're on the tippy top of the mountain, you're going to be impacted by the people above you and what they're doing with their construction and soil. So we as homeowners have some best practices that we can follow. We can reduce the pollution, improve infiltration, and conserve the water. And you might be able to guess that we're here to talk about specifically one of those things. Rain barrels being the way of conserving the water. Rain gardens is another option that we have that you can look into if there's an area that stays wet long after the rain. Um, vegetated swales, riparian buffers, and other best practices here that you can see and read. Why is lawn management being a, one that many people do not follow? But that's outside the scope of this class. So we're going to talk about conserving the water. The average American household, 320 gallons of water per day. So I don't think I use 320, but obviously some families use a lot more. So it averages to 320. And a lot of that is for outdoor use. And you're paying for that, whether it's from pumping your own well or from the municipality providing it to you. And na nationwide landscaping uses 9 billion gallons per day, landscaping ir irrigation, one third of all water use. Rain barrel reduces stormwater runoff. You don't have to pay for the, the uh, chemical um, processing of your water if you get it from the municipality and you don't have to pump it from your well. So we get benefits from that. How much can you harvest off of your house, off of your roof or wherever you are harvesting your water from? Depends on the rooftop, but you have basically in an inch of water per rain barrel times the square foot of your roof times 0 0.6 to convert that into gallons. And you get the number of gallons that a rain event will happen on your section of roof. So here we see a house that has um, a small porch, roof over the porch, and then a bigger roof on the house, and multiple downspouts. So you have to count the square foot of the roof that works on that downspout. And if you think about what the average rain event is, it's usually less than an inch. Um, you can see that it doesn't take that big of a roof to fill your rain barrel. So if we have an 800 square foot roof, 20 by 40, one inch rainfall event is 500 gallons of rain. And here with 45 inches of rainfall per year, that's 22,000 gallons just hitting your roof. So you can ponder where you're going to put it. You're gonna, you can ponder how many rain barrels you need. If they're 50 gallons, obviously you need 10 rain barrels to handle a one inch rain event. So um, not likely to happen, but we're gonna save at least a fraction of that. And you can save money if you're connect, connected to a municipal water. 
and you can also protect your valuable landscaping during a drought. You can use that water for free and use it when you, we don't have enough rain. So what can we do with the water that we save? We can water gardens and trees and lawns. Koi ponds, if tested, uh, I would hesitate with that one. Um, there are lots of other uses you can, can use. You can wash your muddy feet your dog, your car, cleaning windows. If your pump's not working, you can use the water in your toilet and birds and bath fountains. So the reason I question the koi pond is depends on what's on your roof. What type of um, surface is it? Is it uh, slate? Is it um, asphalt tiles? Is it copper? Lots of different roofs. Some people put anti-moss treatments on their pond, on their roof. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then there's the birds that uh, fly by and, and uh, give us little gifts up on top of our roof. So there's lots of other things in the water. So do not, there are some things we say, uh, Obviously, do not use it for water, um, for cooking or drinking because of all those things we talked about. Um, the water collected from the roof can be laden with those things, including potential bacteria, lots of dust, other airborne materials, and chemicals from your roof material. So play it safe. Use it for those things that you are not going to consume. If you really want to, you can get the water tested. I use mine for watering um, plants and I do water some of my herb garden. Uh, most plants will filter it through, you know, filter the water through their roots and you're not eating them. If you are sprinkling the rainwater from the rain barrel on top of the leafy vegetables and would want to eat that, that would be of some concern. But usually if you're watering the ground, uh, you're okay. And just make sure you, you wash things off uh, with clean water. Here we talk about some people have, have different roofs, including zinc and strips. That's where that was. And also, what type of gutter you have. If you live in a really old house, they could be lead-based or lead-based paints. Um, don't use again if we have moss killer on your roof. And use the water on a semi-regular basis to discourage algal growth. Uh, the algae I've found uh, is not that big of a deal. Um, it's depending on the color of your rain barrel. If it's white, some light is going to go into it, and over time you might get a buildup of algae, but it's usually not that big of a deal. And we're going to clean it out at least once a year. And I've I've actually gone a couple of years without cleaning mine out, and it's it's not been an issue. But you do want to use that water. So this is a basic bit, um, rain barrel design. You got a hole on the top to let the water in, you have an overflow, and you have a spigot so that you can use it. And it's on some type of surface that can handle the weight. So here we see a drawing, and remember I mentioned at the very beginning, the higher you have this to get the watering can under it, look at all the water that this is wasting. So you're only ever using up maybe 60% of this rain barrel and 40% is never being used. So you want this spigot as low as possible, which mean, in this example means raising the rain barrel. And we saw a picture of that. There's lots of ways to raise it. Um, pavers, you can build wood, you can use cinder blocks. We'll see a couple more examples of those. Saw this picture at the beginning. These are the parts we have put together the kit and prepared the barrel, and you will be getting everything you need to put it together, and that with the one piece, the overflow piece being mailed to you since they're out of stock, 
everywhere. Uh, this is the process that we've gone through. We've drilled a hole in the top. You won't need to, to use these tools. You are allowed to uh, paint them. If you do paint them, this is what many of the barrels get. Some might be blue. This is a white one. And you can paint it as long as you use paint that is um, for painting plastic objects. Otherwise, it might not adhere very well. So we create the inflow. We install the spigot, overflow. And then you have, this is up to you. We can't do this for you. Um, connect to the downspout. So he's cutting at an angle, it looks like. I would recommend a uh, perpendicular cut. And then some type of adapter. And we'll see a couple examples in the next coming slides. This one we saw before. It's a hose that actually there's a, a junction that in, sits inside or in between the two sections of downspout and fills up. And when the water fills up the rain barrel, it doesn't allow any more water in and continues down the downspout. So that's a pretty cool solution. It's a little pricier option, um, but then you don't have to worry about the overflow of where to run the overflow from the actual rain barrel. But you do have to plan for that overflow. So at some point, it will fill up. Um, we this The piece that we're talking about for the overflow is a um, little piece that you can uh, screw a hose to, and you can have it flow through the hose and be redirected. Uh, if we get a downpour, as you can see here, there's a lot of water going in. That much water cannot flow out the garden hose. So there will be overflow on big rain events at the site of your rain barrel. So plan for that as well. Here's an example of a very fancy painted rain barrel. So if you are artistic, you can have it blend in to whatever landscape you want or have it just very decorative. To paint, um, Make sure you uh, braid the surface, and, and when you buy the paint, it will have the instructions. Make sure it's dusted and dry. Prime it, spray it, and then uh, pay attention to edges where it would likely peel eventually. So I joked that you could have 10 um, rain barrels for that one inch rain event that stores 500 gallons. Um, this is an example. There are different ways you can connect the overflow into the second barrel. And so when the first barrel fills up, it overflows into the second barrel. Then when the second barrel overflows, it flows into the third barrel. That would be the um, serial way of collecting them. You can also uh, connect them parallel, where at the bottom with the spigots are connected, or you connect the spigots of all three, and they all fill up at the same rate. And then you have to have a pipe going between all three, and then that pipe needs to have a spigot so that you can use it. If you're interested in that, there are, it's easy to find uh, those options online. You can Google that and figure it out. And here we see a connector to the downspout. They've plugged in, I'm not sure what's going to divert the water in this case into the rain barrels, but that there's probably something on the inside a little um, uh, flange that goes out that, you know, as the water's pouring down, it uh, directs it into the pipe, but allows it to overflow. So a little cup kind of thing. Mike, do you have time for uh, a sure. question? Yep. Um, Carol, you have a hand raised. You can now unmute and ask your question. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have pushed that by mistake. I apologize. <laughs> That's I'm fine. not used to this um, application. Okay, no worries. Um, we did get a comment in the chat that um, someone said that a farmer told him he put charcoal in the rain barrel to reduce algae growth. I don't know if you've heard of that or if there's if that is helpful or not. 
I have not heard of that. I'm not sure if uh, that is anti-algal or not. Um, there are um, barley solutions. Bar barley as it rots um, releases an anti-algal compound. So ponds have, have that in it. Um, if it's an issue, I, I am not aware that it's an actual issue. A little algal growth around the edge, uh, around the outside or the inside of the barrel will make it more opaque and reduce the amount of light that goes in. But I've never had you know, large quantities of, of algae being an issue in my, my two rain barrels. Um, but I have not researched that, so that's news to me. So I cannot give you a definitive answer about charcoal. Okay, and then uh, Mary was asking where you could find a connector for the tiered um, rain barrels system. I don't know that I've ever seen a commercial one. Um, they're usually connected via a PVC pipe. And I don't know if we have an example, photo example in this one. Um, these are connected in the back, apparently, because we can't see it. Um, but usually they're connected with a PVC pipe, and then the PVC pipe has a spigot in the middle of it. Um, hopefully we come up with one. But yeah, if you Google multiple rain barrels, you should be able to see some different options. And then uh, Beth was asking, is it okay if she uses the water for her indoor plants? Yeah, if they're non-edible, it's uh, fine water to be used. I um, have enough outdoor plants. <laughs> I don't, don't uh, well, actually, I bring all my up indoor plants outdoors in the summer. Okay, I think that's it Any for now. Questions? Thank you. No, that's it for now. Thanks. For now. Okay. Feel free to ask questions, um, everyone. You can ask anytime. And we'll have a, a spot at the end also. So other things to be uh, aware of, make sure it has a top cover. You don't want uh, curious animals going in there and finding out. Make sure it's on a stable platform. Um, if you build up, make sure whatever's on the ground is stable. These are very heavy when they're full, uh, a couple hundred pounds. So it could you know, fall and make a big bang. And if somebody's near it, it would hurt. Um, if you're not sure how stable it is, have it tilt back into the house so that it won't fall over. Um, then you know, when we, at the end of the season, when we clean it, we empty it, you can readjust and make make it level again. But if you're not sure, error on the side that it, it goes up against the house instead of falling over. Other things, easy to get to, easy to uh, clean or store, um, that it's sealed. We will have screening on the inflow to keep uh, sediment from the, the roof tiles out and keep at small animals out and keep mosquitoes out. So um, we do want to make sure that we keep the mosquitoes out and leaves and twigs and stuff like that. I've not had a mosquito problem and I've not heard of anyone having a mosquito problem um, going through the hose. That's a long trip for a mosquito to make or through the overflow outlet. I've, I've not heard. And if you're concerned, um, you can always, um, if you're not using your overflow, you can always just put an end cap on there so that um, either it doesn't overflow or you don't have the mosquito issue, if that's what you're worried about. You can also get mosquito dunks, which are a naturally occurring uh, microbe that will uh, keep mosquitoes at bay. They're called mosquito dunks. You can also get mosquito crumbles, which are just broken up dunks the dunks are like a donut shape about that big or so those are other options for mosquitoes where on your property so obviously it needs to be near a downspout um and 
hopefully near where you are going to use the water. The closer it is, the more likely you're going to use it, and therefore the more use you will get out of it. And the more you use it, the more you save from runoff. Uh, it stores you know, different sizes, you know, 40 to 50 gallons is the most common. And if you don't use it, you've saved 50 gallons out of the you know, 20,000 that uh, would show up. So you want to use it to make it the most, shall we say, useful. Um, so here's some, um, which side of the barrel is connected to the hose. So how it's partitioned, you know, positioned, uh, inflow is going to be on, on one side, and then which side do you want the spigot on? We, these are, I believe, pre-built, so the spigots are going to be on the opposite side of the inflow. And then make sure it looks good in its location. So here's another example of a, a store-bought rain barrel. Some of these rain barrels can cost a couple hundred dollars, depending on how um, aesthetic they are and the shape and the size. Uh, this one's actually a relatively small one, but has a, a nice shape to it. Um, so as I mentioned, annually disconnect the drain and clean out the debris. You do not want to have um, have it freeze in the middle of winter when it's full, it will probably burst. Um, if nothing else, the fixtures will burst. So if you can, the best thing to do is, is store it away if you have a shed that you have room in. Um, if you don't have a room to put it out of the way, turning it upside down is an option. Uh, keeping it in place or, or near where it is and just turn it upside down. If that's not an option, um, keeping the spigot open so that you never get a lot of water in there and you don't get water in the spigot to freeze because the spigot's the most likely to be uh, damaged. So those are the, the things I do. Um, hopefully you can re-divert the water back into its original downspout so it's not flowing through the rain barrel. So when you cut your downspout to make an insert for your rain barrel, don't throw the rest away. You can uh, continue to use that. And we'll see another example here in a sec. So maintenance uh, could leak, could fill up. And if this the screening, this isn't what yours will look like, but if the screen fills up, it's not going to um, infiltrate, so to speak, and will overflow. So make sure everything's good, make sure there's no debris, and make sure your overflow location is, is accepting the water and that it's still working. As I mentioned, empty the barrel, disconnect it, or completely drain it at least, and then reconnect it back in the spring when, if there's a light freeze or frost, that's not usually a problem. Um, if it's going to get below 30 degrees or uh, below 32 for any period of time, you might want to drain it. So just leave the spigot open. Then when temperatures uh, get back above freezing, you can close it off and save any water in the future there. So if you got too excited and opened it too early, you might lose a little bit water, but better than breaking your uh, rain barrel. So we have more resources about stormwater management there's extension.psu.edu again you can find out more uh, information about workshops coming up i saw in the chat that someone was asking about um, best practices lawn management and stuff like that you can find out um, either online resources or upcoming events so stay connected to Penn State. We have a lot of stuff to offer. A lot of it's customizable. And you can sign up and, and the customizing part is click on the areas of your interest. So you do, will not get bombarded with 
everything, you can say, give me information on these specific um, events or topics. And I'll leave on this page with Brad's, he's our extension educator for the Lehigh and Northampton County um, extension. And that's his information. Here's another picture of a rain barrel and there's the overflow, nicely painted. And here, this, this is how I connect mine with a flexible extension. So I put the, you can't see the downspout, but I put the this over the downspout it flows in um, and you can redirect it within a couple of feet into your rain barrel and then you can also have um, reconnect it back to the downspout that uh, you left hanging behind there so th those are the that's the way i connect mine and you can see here they just use paver stones stacked up to make it nice and high so that's a, a nicely designed and very colorful rain barrel. So that's the presentation. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, someone was asking if there's a pre preference for whether the barrel goes in shaded versus a sunny area. Um, no preference per se. It's it's more on where you are going to use it and where you know your um, downspot is so if you have the choice between the two you know you might have if you're worried about algal growth the shady area would be the better of the two but there's not a, a major issue about that all right well while we are um uh, waiting for to see if there's other questions uh, I just want to quickly show. I put a, in the in the chat um, a link to how to get to Nurture Nature Center. I'm going to show it here. It's it's on our website. It gives you directions. The pickup is going to be in the back of our building. So uh, Nurture Nature Center is there at the center of the screen, and then right behind Nurture Nature Center is our parking lot, which you can access from South Fifth Street. So you just turn on South Fifth Street and then turn on Pine Street and you'll be able to, to access our parking lot and pick up the free rain barrel kit. Um, and again, if you haven't signed up for a time slot, please do so. I'll put the, the link again. And if you have not given me your, your mailing address, please do so, so that I can, um, make sure you get that missing part. Um, let's see, a couple of people asked where we pick it up. Uh, again, that's at Nurture Nature Center, and I am, I showed um, directions, and I put, I'll put the link again into the chat box for you to have directions and to find out where the center is. Um, someone asks, is there anything to do with the downspout once the barrel is disconnected for the winter? Um, best would be to reconnect it if you can. So if you use the flexible um, piece that we saw, you can take it, off, you know, the end off the barrel and connect it back up to the original downspout. So you would need, you know, a gap of a couple of feet to to squeeze that back in there. Um, there are, if you want, you can search for other types of rain barrel connectors, do a quick search online, and you will see all kinds of different ones. There's special ones that you know fit right in line and it has a lever, rain barrel, or downspout, so you can switch it back and forth based on the season. Obviously, those are a little more expensive, but there are lots of different options. Um, but the flexible ones, you can get them in white and brown, I think, are the two main colors, depending on your downspout color. And you know, they work well. You can get that, them at any big box store, and they're only a couple of bucks. That's the easiest and simplest way. But there are other more aesthetic options if you want to look for those.
So Brad and I both sent an e a, a link to ourselves as in the extensions. Let me make that to, oh, how do, how do I send a link to everybody? It should, um, you can put it in the chat and it, there should be a drop down to send it to the entire audience. I'm not seeing the entire audience. Do you see the link that Brad and I both sent to organizers and panelists? Yes. <laughs> Maybe you can I send will, that to everybody. Yeah, I'll send that to everybody. Brad's got another one. Can't hear you, Brad. So Oops, so I'm Brad. I will be at Nurture Nature Center with another Master Watershed Steward volunteer, as well as um, Rachel Hogan Carr, who's the director at Nurture Nature. We'll be helping you get your barrels loaded up. Um, we ask that you do wear a mask, um, and when you arrive, announce your name so we can get you checked off on our list, and then that barrel over to you. Um, again, if you follow Kate's Sign Up Genius link there. Um, please sign up in there so we know when you're arriving and can plan accordingly. <clears throat> All right, are there any other questions? Eight. Carol, you have a, you can speak. Yes, um, I just, I saw a quick picture of the rain barrel that had a rain chain attached um, above it. I've seen some of these recently on Facebook. Uh, people were looking for them and it's uh, unique, I think. Can you please show that picture again if you have it? Yes, if, uh... If Kate will give me options, there we go, show screen. Are you seeing my the last screen there? Yes, I see the um, presentation screen. Okay, let me go back. Oh, there it was. Oh, there it was, yep. So that's an example, that's an old whiskey barrel that they're using, I'm not, and obviously there's some ice on top, so that would mostly work, you know, depending on how accurate the, the water flowing down is, because there's a slight bump up. So it's not whatever falls on top of the barrels that you will be getting. Um, but yes, that is a design option. You can see it's coming out of a spigot there, or a, a downspout, it looks like. Great, thank you. Brad, is there a phone number um, that they can use when they're arriving to pick up? I can ask Rachel if she wouldn't mind. I didn't know if you wanted to provide yours or not. That's probably your, your desk phone number. Um, Laura is I have asking. I a number for you. I'm sorry about that. Um, the number is 484-291-1620. All right, and then Laura was asking, are there other ways to collect rainwater without a spout, possibly a freestanding one? Um, that's a lot <laughs> harder. So what the roof is doing is it's collecting from a large area and condensing it into the downspout. So if you get um, just that, the hole, which is only you know four inches across, um, the water falling into there, that, that's the goal is to get water into that four inch hole. Um, so you have to collect it from some surface, otherwise you're, it will take all year to fill up the rain barrel. Um, some people have sheds, and if you don't have 
downspout on a portion of the roof, you can install a um, gutter strip. Um, usually it's over a doorway. You'll see these on people who's, who don't have downspouts. They'll have a strip to divert it left and right from a doorway. So you walk under and you're not getting rained on. You could put that along your shed and that, that would divert the water to one corner. And you know that way you, you can hopefully aim well or do something only in the corner without installing a whole downspout system. Um, but the goal is to large surface into a small spot. Does that answer the question? Can you give me more information about where you want to put it? I think so. Um, Brad, can you say that number again? Someone else is asking. Sorry, it was 484. It's 484-291-1620. Ah, see it. Sorry about that. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions. Again, please sign up for a time slot and email me your address, and I will be sending around a recording of this after um, uh, later today. So I want to thank Brad so much for coordinating all of the the ray barrels and putting the kits together and and doing the pickup and i want to thank mike for this great presentation um and thank you all for attending i hope everybody has a wonderful weekend